Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I would like to welcome Dr. Lindsay Berkson. Dr. Berkson is an integrative nutritional gastrointestinal endocrine specialist who focuses her practice on complex cases, high-risk hormonal patients, and severe gastroenterologic cases trying to avoid surgery. She is a sought-out speaker, has authored dozens of books, hosts a medical podcast, and consults with patients and physicians all over the world. Good afternoon, Dr. Brooks, and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I'm excited to share my story and to hear your story oh, and to... No, you're not hearing my story. <laughs> <laughs> this is a... This Dread. Is a I, I like I a two-way, not just a one-way. Okay. I ask the questions, you give the answers. This is kind of how this works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward. I know that um, you have quite... You, you've, from what I've been able to read about you, you've lived the life of, I don't know, 20 people. So, and I'm not really sure where you've been reading about me, so <laughs> we'll have to see. <laughs> well, why don't we start at the beginning? Why don't you tell me about, or tell us about your interest in the sciences when you were younger, or, or what first sparked your interest in going on to study medicine? Well, my mother and my grandmother were very health oriented, and my mother was, in fact, we're in Chicago now. And my mother was the first state champion in tennis and fencing, so she said, move, move, move. And I was always encouraged to exercise, and my grandmother and mother were somewhat interested in nutrition. And early on, I heard a lecture that you are what you eat by Scott Nearing, who went on to really initiate the organic gardening movement with Elliot Coleman up in Vermont and Maine. And so early on, I was doing many things that made sense with the very beginning of this whole movement of the body, mind, spirit movement. In fact, when I was teaching, I was a yoga teacher for many years and lived in India. And when I was teaching breathing and mindfulness, I got a job in Vermont in the high schools to teach mindfulness. By the way, I got fired for being a pagan. <laughs> I wish I would have saved that little slip. But based on that, there was a doctor named Dr. Albright who was a family practitioner in the small town in Vermont where I was. And he had just come back from England. And he had just been to a renaissance fair called Spirit, Body, Mind. And he said, I've been contemplating this. And I think that health really exists on three levels. And I don't want to copy or plagiarize the name of the renaissance fair, but I'm going to tweak it. So I'm going to call it Body, Mind, Spirit. And I think that there should be a, a collaboration of medical doctors and different people who are thought leaders. So I was invited to contribute to that book. And it was the first time the term Body, Mind, Spirit was used. It was published by Stephen Green Press, and that press doesn't even exist anymore. But now that term has gone into the society and the consciousness of the society that we are multifactorial as people, and sometimes disease is multifactorial. So that got me thinking about a lot of issues, that, and I was always perplexed because I was eating right and exercising, doing everything right, but I was getting wrong outcomes. I would continually get ill. And I know many people's story about getting into functional medicine is that they were living wrong. Then they got a diagnosis, and then they start doing everything right, and they really get he healed in a way that allopathic medicine can't heal them. But for me, it was the opposite. I was already exercising. I'd start eating organically when I was around 17. I even had my own cows, raised my own food. Even now with a family, I raised my own animals. and. We don't have them be exposed to any pharmaceuticals. We have our own slaughterhouse, in fact. So I've been doing that all my life, but for many years I was very ill. And nobody could really give me answers. So I started the journey of why am I doing right things, but I'm ill. And I began going into the functional medicine pathway. In fact, my first rotation in integrative medicine was with Jonathan Wright. Alan Gaby was a student, and the two of us really learned about body, mind, spirit because he tested the microbiome with a Heidelberg gastric analysis machine and he said that hormones were a big part of health and nutrition. In fact, it was only one or two years later that he wrote the first prescription for bioidentical hormones. I think I merged with him before that. But still, I kept getting ill and seriously ill. So as I moved through my life, 
doing everything right. I ended up losing seven and a half organs, being diagnosed with cancer twice, oh having 15 major surgeries, exercising, eating organic foods. Most people eat a better diet and I just heard someone have a cancer free health coaching session this week that 200,000 people entered and it was if you make choices, better choices, you won't get ill. Now often that is true, but it wasn't true for me. So I love to write. I had a book out before, Body, Mind, Spirit. So I read an article one day on the power of signals. In fact, there's a great Seinfeld routine where George Costanza is talking to Jerry who's saying, I don't understand women, don't understand women. And George says, it's all about signals, Jerry. It's all about signals. And life, our organs cross talk with each other through signals. And so I read an article that external pollutants in our environment 24 seven and a plethora of them were sabotaging, getting into our body and assaulting our signals. And that made sense to me that this was another element of health that people hadn't talked about. So I ended up researching one of my books, I now have 21 books out, and the 22nd is coming out soon. But that I started researching in the 1990s, and the field of endocrine disruption was just starting to come together. And as I was writing that book, I noticed that many of the laboratory animals exposed to powerful endocrine disrupting compounds had the same health issues that I'd been battling. So the light bulb went off over my head. And I said, I should write away for my mother's microfish birth records. And I'm one of the first group of people that, um, well, I'll tell you that story in just a minute. So I wrote away for my mother's microfish records, and I got them. And when the envelope came to my house, I had shaking hands to open it up to see if I was exposed to this powerful model of endocrine disruption that was really the basis of the field. Was I a very victim of the scientific book that I was working on. And I opened up the envelope and read that my mother had been given diethylstabestrol, the acronym is DES, the first trimester. She'd been given it by injection and pill. And that answered why I couldn't have children. And all of the many illnesses that I kept bumping into, doing everything right, getting the wrong answers, started to make sense. So now I had an understanding of root cause. Root cause gives the practitioner and the patient the big aha and hope. Because if you can see, and sometimes there's multiple root causes, usually a perfect storm comes together to make you ill. But this was a definitive exposure while my mother was pregnant when you're the most vulnerable of all. Based on that book, I had been invited to be a scholar at a think tank at Tulane University, merged with Xavier University Charity Hospital and Tulane Med School. And the gentleman who wrote the foreword to my book was the gentleman who figured out why girls and boys, they're called DES daughters and DES sons, that were exposed to this drug in utero were so ill, got so many cancers, so many tumors, so much diabetes, died early, no matter how they lived. In fact, um, I ended up getting breast cancer while I was writing that book, and I helped put together the data that started to point a path that daughters exposed to that chemical had breast cancer about in a two-year window. And Dartmouth University did a study where they were later able to prove that that was true. And in fact, just last year or the year before, the first few DES daughters got huge amounts of money for getting breast cancer and showing that link. But once I knew what was wrong, then I could say, well, how does DES cause tumors? And because I was working with the top scientists in the field at Tulane and researching for my book, we discovered that it blocked two tumor suppressor genes. For example, P53, and it blocked a Wnt gene. Well, I had some more root cause data. Now I had to sleuth the literature and figure out what might reconstitute those genes. Was there anything around that could reboot them? Now this is functional medicine thinking. This is root cause thinking because 
I had been told by so many doctors, you've had so many organs removed, you're just going to have to learn how to age gracefully. You're never going to be a really well person. One of the endocrinologists where I live put his hand on my shoulder and said, life is a book. And the first chapter of your book was young, younger and healthier when you were very young. But it, in your 20s, you bumped into the second chapter part of your book. And that's what you're going to have to age gracefully and suck it up. And you're never going to be a totally well person. And the more you can come to peace with that, the better off you'll be. Did you kick him between his legs or what? <laughs> Over my gym is written, never, never, never give up. So I never take old or ill for an answer. Mm -hmm. So I discovered in the literature and with the help of the scientists that there was a molecule that rebooted those genes. And it was a metabolite of estrogen, the final metabolite that no one really knows what it does. But it, in some of the literature and some of the older literature and some of the really far off exotic literature, it suggested that it helped those genes the, the tumor suppressor genes work better. So I had my mentor write me the first prescription in the United States for this bioidentical form of 2-methoxyestradiol. Its nickname is 2-MeO. I have to knock on some wood somewhere. And I have not ever had a tumor again. Amen. Oh, Unbelievable. That was really huge. And how many years ago was that? That was 16 years ago. And how many books ago? <laughs> <laughs> that's an incredible story. That's an incredible story. And I, I guess that paved the, the last 16 years of your, your journey. It's had so much to do. I've now had about 500 patients that have been put on 2-MEO, and I've used it in different forms, like eye drop forms and a variety of things. And it's opened the door. Hormones are my love. And about 15 or 16 of my books are about hormones in one way or another. My latest book was called Sexy Brain. It was on hormones in there. Um, it's called Sexy Can Brain. Can you give us the Cliff Notes version of that? Well, sex steroid hormones run our brain. That's why it's called Sexy Brain. But so many of the chemicals that we're exposed to from morning till night or in the amniotic fluid in the womb tend to be hormone-altering chemicals, and they can adversely affect our hormones and thus our brain. And in fact, even our human inter authentic interaction with each other. Many of the hormones that we make by interaction, by hugging, by hanging out with each other, by bonding and up in the boudoir, are hormones that tend our brain. Nature never does anything without a purpose. Nature wants us to have community and connect. So those hormones will better caretake our brain so we'd be better parents for the next generation. Nature's all about the next generation. But we have hormone-altering chemicals. We live in a toxic soup. The average teenager is exposed to about 22 hormone-altering chemicals before they leave the bathroom in the morning. So we live in a different time. So I wrote that book about that story and how to protect our hormones and our brain and our Do kids. Do EMFs come involved, get involved with that? I think EMFs definitely have an effect. We know they affect melatonin quite a bit in people who um, are exposed, who are high wire, uh, who are workers that are working on high wires. And they have different rates of hormonally driven cancers. For example, women who work on telephone, the old time telephone poles, and now they work on different types of wires, have a much higher incidence of estrogen driven breast cancer. So we know EMFs are part of it, but that wasn't part of the book. book. But the whole technology. Kids don't learn to bond anymore in the eye. They bond more with a screen. But bonding releases chemicals that are brain protective. So it is a lifestyle. It isn't just the chemicals. But that was my last book. So tell me about your practice. So now I've been in practice starting out with a master's in nutrition and going through a variety of different schooling. And if you want, I can go through that. Yes, please. Um, you so, have a lot of designations after your name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I started out with my master's in nutrition, and then after that, when I spent time with some real luminaries, like um, Dr. Bernard Jensen had the Hidden Valley Health Ranch in Escondido, and he was using flaxseed back then and doing detox, and people would come from all around the world, and he was a chiropractor. 
So I said, I want to be like you. He said, go to chiropractic school. So I went to the school that had a dual program for naturopathic medicine and chiropractic. So I went to Nash National Na uh, Naturopathic College and Western States. And then they ended, the program had been 75 years old, and then they ended the program. And so I didn't finish with the naturopathic license, but I got my DC. And I went on, the whole time I was teaching nutrition, all that time, and lecturing, I ended up designing while I just got out of school, the first femline for metagenics and the first menopause natural product in the United States. I love to formulate, it's kind of like cooking. <laughs> I love to cook. And then from there I went on and got three higher board certifications in nutrition, which are some of those letters. And then based on hormone deception, I was asked to be that scholar. And that was really one of my most major academic points in my career because I got to work with the top scientists in the field in hormones. So I worked with Elwood Jensen, who discovered estrogen receptor alpha. I worked with Yanaki Gustafsson, who discovered estrogen receptor beta. And one, at this think tank called the Center for Bioenvironmental Research, they were all about estrogens and how hormone altering chemicals were affecting our estrogens. Now it's overlapped into all the other hormones. And they put on about 30 plus years of symposiums on this, first called Estrogen in the Environment, and the last six or seven were called E. Hormone. And the last one were all the gathering of the biggest brains in hormone and endocrinologic function and receptor physiology of the world. So I said to Elwood Jensen, whose wife had been a cabaret singer from Germany, they met at a nudist camp. <laughs> I don't know if that should be on air. He's died a few years ago. He's a wonderful man. I said, we have to do something great. We have all these amazing minds. So we rented out a smoke-free cabaret in New Orleans, and his wife had a feather boa on, stood by a piano, and sang a hormone song that I wrote. And I did a whole <laughs> rap thing about all these people coming up with it. Elwood Jensen's understanding of how hormones deliver signals to receptors, which at first was not well received, is the basis of how breast cancer patients are, um, are given an understanding of whether ER positive or PR positive, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so he eventually was given a huge Lasker Award and so forth. But the first person to usually come up with the idea is often not well received. So we did a whole entire hip hop rap show for these scientists. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's unbelievable. So I, I noticed that you have your name on a couple of patents as well, so just because the books aren't enough and everything else that you're involved in. Well, when Jonathan and Wright and I were discussing 2-methoxyestradiol, because it's so, it's not an estrogen signaling metabolite, it's protective against breast cancer. It's protective against multiple cancers. It has phase one and two trials on it against multiple can refractory cancers that no one could help and failed other treatments and has a very high rate of remission. But the oral patentable form had created a lot of nausea in people and had very big compliance issues. So that wasn't used. So we thought, why don't we make a bioidentical hormone that has a little bit of estriol that's anti-carcinogenic, some of the nutrients that really help coordinate. For example, vitamin B6 is a metronomic vitamin that makes signal signal for the right amount of duration. It's, it's like a metronome for your estrogen to signal just right and leave the receptors. <laughs> signal just right and leave the receptors. So we thought we'll put some <clears throat> B6 in there and we'll put some 2-MeO, 2 2-methoxyestradiol 2 in there and it'll be fantastic. So we created a patent and um, it, there, it's very, very difficult. You need a lot of money. And we started talking with Tulane, and we tried to go forward with that, but that one had a difficult time. But it was a great idea. And the other patent was when I moved to Austin, and I was so ill and was having one of my surgeries, I met with a very famous kidney doctor, because I had to have a kidney removed. And his name was Dr. Jack Moncrief. And he invented the home unit, uh, the peritoneal dialysis home unit. So it's called uh, Continuous Ambulatory Peritoneal Dialysis, CAPD. So he invented that. 
and he's invented catheters. There's the Moncrief catheter. He's very well known. When you see him, he's got awards and patents all over his walls. So while I was sitting in his office as a patient, I said, you know, I've got an idea. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> so he and I and another doctor named Dr. Kenneth Burton, who was actually a physician on Air Force One for Eisenhower, hmm. and he had been in practice a long time. You know, a lot of these elderly docs have su are such rich resources. In the United States today, we don't honor so much someone who isn't young, but functional medicine's not like that, and we have people who are just brilliant and add so much to it. So Dr. Moncrief and Dr. Burton and myself invented this medicine that we got a patent on for non-healing lesions and highly immunocompromised patients like dialysis patients and diabetics, and then we ended up doing a research study with Nathan Bryan because we felt that these patients get so ill that they get nitric oxide um, really removed out of their bloodstream by the very act of being dialyzed. So we had this concept. I met Nathan at a Christmas party. We started chatting. And we ended up, it, since Dr. Moncrief is so innovative and visionary, we all converged, and we did this together with the University of Texas Medical School at Houston, and we finally published that data. And we thought we would change the face of dialysis because we were able to show that nitric oxide is, is lost in the act of that, and if you replace it, we could probably minimize a lot of the complications. But there's only so much money for Medicaid for those patients, and they're really not invested in extending their life. But I've got a great little story with Dr. Moncrief and me, because you said I remind you of Barbara Streisand. Yes, you do. So about once a day, somebody says to me, I look like Barbara Streisand, oh, but younger, <laughs> oh, but poorer. <laughs> And I told this to Dr. Moncrief, who's an amazing guy, and he said, I don't see it. I don't believe it. I think you're prone to hyperbole. <laughs> yeah. So we had a patient that was in quarantine at St. David's Hospital and was using our, had been using our medication prior to them getting so ill. And we had to go in bunny suits. You know, we had to have the hood on, and our whole body would look like a you know, an astronaut suit, and the only thing where you could see me was a little teeny rectangle plastic <laughs> window for my eyes, and we went and saw the patient. We came out. We were standing at the little metal desk in the hallway of the hospital and writing up our notes, and that's we're completely covered from head to toe, and a nurse walks by. She goes a little bit past me, and then she comes next to me, and she puts her hand on my shoulder, and she said, has anyone ever told you you look exactly like Barbara Streisand? <laughs> I love it. Can you sing? People will pay me not, not to, to sing. sing. <laughs> Rumor has it, though, that you've got a little comedy thing going on. Um, so it's very important to have balance in life, and that's never been a problem for me. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of theatrics in my family. My brother was a professor of theater for 44 years and worked with Second City. My oh, wow. mother was a playwright and an musical playwright, and my father was an actor and a gymnast before he became a lawyer, so everyone in my family has somewhat of a big mouth <laughs> and loves humor. And it's, a lot of comedians are Jewish, and in the Jewish tradition, the family would come for coffee in, and the, everyone would come with a great joke, and you go around the table and you tell a great joke. So a Jewish woman in Austin, Texas, said, you know, I think we should start a group that's a comedy club that's a version of Toastmasters. There's 330,000 Toastmasters in the United States, and we'll open one of the five comedy clubs that so she did, and it is a brilliant group. People are in there that are uh, heads, project managers from IBM and Dell that want to not be boring. People are in there that want to do stand-up. I'm in there wanting to drop a few pearls of comedic wisdom along with the other scientific wisdom, and it's a great community and a wonderful way to not always be focused on illness and breast cancer. I specialize now in medical nutrition for breast cancer, so many of my patients are in trauma, so it's good to have comedy. That's an incredible outlet, amazing story, too. And last week, I won second place in a stand-up comedy. And there were more than two people, I hope. <laughs> there were only seven. <laughs> That's great. Congratulations. So where are you taking that, that career next? <laughs> you know, I think it would be very interesting to have, to take it to another level where you combined body, mind, and spirit, medicine, 
spirituality, mindfulness, comedy, especially as you're older. You've been in practice for 40 plus years on this planet. I was so ill, and now with using root cause and functional medicine, I have the honor of having more of the youth in my elder age than I never could have when I was younger. So a lot of those wounds open portals, hopefully, of a bigger vision. And it would be nice to figure out a way to merge that into a tapestry that would somehow have an audience. So I don't know. I'm kind of open. Well, you um, are a researcher. You are 22 authored books. You are well published. You are an educator. You are a comedian. You are a Barbara Streisand lookalike. <laughs> you are a formulator inventor of nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals. Uh, I, w you have so much on your resume. Uh, you have a podcast. You probably can get a singing gig or some sort of you know lookalike thing. God forbid this medical thing doesn't work out. <laughs> but <laughs> sounds like you should come and we could do a duo. <laughs> but I mean, so what? What is next? What? What do you hope? What more do you hope to accomplish? I mean, you have lived. Um, so much in your lifetime, and it's pretty extraordinary what you've accomplished. I haven't looked at it like that before. I'm going to have to remember this when I have my down times. But part of the reason I've been prolific with my books is I couldn't have children due to the DES. They take a lot of time. So my books are my children, and that's why I hope people purchase them. Some of them aren't heavy scientific books, and some are. Like I spent nine months living with my mother in a lockdown dementia unit with oh her caring goodness. for her. So I wrote a book called My Mother Who Wore Her Purse as a Shoe. So some of them are moments into um, other perspectives of life. But I, don't, I feel like I have my life still way ahead of me. I, it's interesting. I never thought being at this age it would be my calling card. But a lot of my patients come in feeling in their early 50s, late 40s, like they're done. And this society defines them as old. And they've lost hope. I have an incredible story. When I was working one week out of each month in Tulsa, because there was this amazing internist that had a PhD in nutrition and double board certified, and this woman came in and she said, I'm done, and I really I feel done, and she was 52, and here mm -hmm. I was way Goodness. older than her, and her st to her she was overweight and tired, but her story was is that she was um, a cantor, and her husband was a rabbi, and he was, they lived in separate bedrooms because he was not loyal to her with many of the p women in the congregation, and she did, felt this job was her identity, and if she left it, she would have le lost everything. And she felt she was way over the hill, she was overweight, way over the hill, couldn't date. So I stand up and I say, let me tell you, I'm on Match.com, and I've been through all this. <laughs> I'm still writing books. I see my life is way ahead, and I tell her my age and what I've been through. And that gives people hope to not give up. She was blown away. We got her hormones balanced, changed her diet. She got divorced. She's on Match.com. <laughs> she wrote me an email. She said, I'm, I've moved out and I'm on Match.com. And about three months later, I get another email. She's in a relationship. Wow. Now I get invited to the wedding. So Mazel tov. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So giving hope. Wow. So in any way that I can give hope and share the story, in a way that's fun for me and fun for others, that would be really an honor. Do you hope, for lack of a better word, that that's what your legacy will be one day? Maybe many decades from now. Oh, you're so wise and respectful to say it like that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I would, you know, when you face that much suffering and so many years where you can't get out of bed and you don't know what's wrong with you, and you're serving all these other people, so something seems wrong with this picture. You have a, you're in a fork in the road. You have a choice to get bitter and shut down, or you have a choice to go deeper and figure out tools to make suffering, which we all face, a smaller font size and invite it in for tea and learn from it. So you hope that wisdom allows you to see bigger pictures, make more tools, and perhaps in sharing that, other people in a society today where there's a lot of easy anger and there's a lot of emphasis on money and external 
and a lot of misunderstanding, yet there's a lot of greatness and good. But you hope that you can take what has been and serve it up to society and have it be a win-win. You are beyond inspiring. There's, it, there has to be a better, bigger, broader term for you. I, uh, I'm in awe. Um, so let me ask you, with your, obviously you're a prolific writer and you seem to enjoy that and, and your babies. Well, writing is painful. And if you ask any writer, they'll say, I love having written. <laughs> but it but seems like you have like to birth worse. it. Because yeah. the new book, for example, the one coming out in 2018, is the one coming out next, oh. which I'm almost done with, is called Nutritional Gastroenterology. Maybe that'll be the subtitle. So or the you title. put out 22 babies. This is like an 800 in page. <laughs> it's many years. It's many years. But my womb has been full. <laughs> so you said it's how many pages? This new book is about 800 pages. It's a tech, kind like of a triplets. textbook. Okay. Oh, triplets. That's it. No wonder it's been feeling a bit taut. <laughs> <Okay>. no. <laughs> Wow, and I'm sorry, and that one, that book is titled? Well, my first gut book came out about 28 years ago called Healthy Digestion the Natural Way. And I think that gut book and Liz Lipsky's gut book were the first two gut books. Mine was the first body, my, um, it was the gut nutrition uh, mind book. So I really talked a lot about how thoughts are also food and how they meet at the enteric nervous system, and that was like almost 30 years ago, and the importance of vaginal births, etc. So I've been wanting to update and change and really there's, and also show the unappreciated role of hormones in the gut. They're not hunger hormones like ghrelin or not the hormones like leptin, but sex hormones. And um, there's some amazing things in this new book. So the book is riddled with new factoids and clinical pearls of the unappreciated role of hormones in the gut, using them for inflammatory bowel disease, and taking the work of healthy digestion to another level. And it kind of, I'm teaching at the gut module this weekend. It was fabulous. The speakers were all stellar. What a great meeting. And this book is somewhat like having that meeting in your reference library. But it's the accumulation of 40 years of practice. Do I dare ask what comes after that? <laughs> I, well, I've been so when I get down and feel my overwhelmed, what I love to do besides go to the gym or canoe or go to the comedy, that you can't do all those things 24 hours a day. So I love to cook. And I've created a chef's kitchen and I love so I have a lot of breast cancer patients. And I want to have them eat no sugar but I want them to eat in a way where they feel so fed and not deprived. So I've come up with about 150 recipes that make you feel like you're at a French restaurant pigging out on a five-star chocolate mousse mm. or just amazing recipes. And while I was here this weekend, I said to Liz, I don't know if I have it in me to do this book. Let's do it together. So we made a deal this weekend to come out with that cookbook, which the recipes are just extraordinary and I love individualizing recipes for my patients and then getting letting them eat wonderful foods and then it makes it easier for them to stay on it so I like being the doc plus being the nutritionist because for my life food has been such a powerful you know I've raised it been an organic gardener and been with Scott Nearing and been seeing the power of food as medicine so that might be the next book but people say I should do a memoir but I don't know about that. But. I'm with the people. Um, so in terms of your practice, so you see oh. patients in your practice, um, you consult with other, you know, how does your practice work? So for many years I had a practice for about 15 years I worked at the Center of uh, for, ortho, uh, for Orthomolecular Medicine in Palo Alto run by a visionary cardiologist and we all worked together the very, it was the very first multidisciplinary clinic in the United States. And we had about 22 docs, and we've all stayed friends all our lives, but slowly people are passing away. And he retired and closed the clinic, and I took the whole staff, bought a building, and opened up my own clinic. And he hated retirement after three months and came back and worked for me. So the nurse and the cardiologist and all of us stayed together for years. And we've still, I just hung out with my nurse in San Diego three weeks ago. We've all become family. 
And we were some of the very first people doing all this. We had chelation, Heidelberg gastric analysis machine. We had sublingual uh, te- uh, uh, allergy drops. And we had a nutrition room and a lecture room. And it was really quite extraordinary because we opened our doors in 1980. And there are not too many places like that now. So I ran that clinic for a long time. And I've worked most of my adult career life in multi-medical team practices. Now it's a little different. I consult with people all over the world as a non-primary care contact consultant. So I have patients in Israel, in Barbados, and I recommend that they have their doctors, their oncologists, their team get on the phone, and I just charge for my time per hour, don't charge any more to have the team on, and I teach a lot, sharing with them why I'm recommending what I recommend, and I do a few of those patients a week, and I started having a mentoring program. And I, I take on medical doctors, nurse practitioners, DOs, chiropractors, and I go over cases with them and share one-on-one and make myself available. And I'm writing. And I just launched my first online course. And it's called Redefining Hormones. And it's for physicians? Well, I put it out there for physicians and smart patients. The majority of people who signed up have been gynecologists, family practice docs, internists. There have been a lot of patients that still get a lot out of it. But you can't look at hormones any more in the same way because hormone-altering chemicals have affected the receptor and the rubber meets the road at the receptor functionality. So I wanted people to have this huge course, about 30 hours of presentation, and then a lot of experts, Dr. David Brownstein is on it, Jack Monaco, Alan Gaby, Carol Roberts. So I have all these experts come in and talk about hormones from different aspects. So it's a real work of an introduction to hormones that takes it to another level. So I love having all these projects and then having time to canoe and dance and do comedy and not be rushed and not be out of breath. So I have these projects and the number of patients, so I have kind of a peaceful time. I have this amount for this and this amount for this, and then if I need to just relax and look out over the lake and... Do you? Yes, I do a lot. A lot. I do Where not. do you find the time? I'm sorry, but from from everything that you've said that you are involved in and that you have your hands in, it is because uh, I do again, each of it for 20 people. I don't know. It doesn't. I, I'm doing it in a way where it seems like there's only so many hours. I'm doing one project and so many hours to the other, you've been able and to then I try the balance. and I try and have two or three hours a day where I relax every day, and maybe some days you have three or four days in a row where you have a deadline and you're really on. You know, up to the wall. But on the whole, I really try and not abandon myself to the franticness that can happen in America with our addiction to work, although my work is my passion. So I really try and have two, three hours a day. Go to the gym almost every single day. At my age, you cannot miss a day. And the gym looks out over a lake. And I sit and look out over that lake. And that is part of my day. How did you first come to hear of A4M? Walter Crinion. Well, first of all, Pam Smith has been marvelous about introducing me to A4M, but I heard that Walter Crinion was giving an, an envir- speaking at an environmental module, I think it was in Las Vegas, and he was the environmental chair at the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. And when I had breast cancer, Alan Gaby and I detoxed together as a way. Alan sent me a card with the outline of two breasts and said, I love these, dear friend. Let's go detox together. And I went and lived on his couch for six weeks, and we detoxed with Walter Crinion heading it, and we became colleagues and friends. And I have so much respect for what he's done for environmental medicine. And he was leading this course, and I thought, I'm going to go listen to that. And then I met Pam. And Pam has been very instrumental in me learning and meeting more luminaries in this incredible institution that has an outreach of 120 countries. It's extraordinary. The course that I have the honor to be part of this weekend is extraordinary. The way that people have worked and put together the data, they Vulcan mind meld to all those docs, so much information in a usable manner. It's just brilliant. So I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about your memoir that you should write and that Barbara Streisand should play you in the movie. (laughs) 
my father said to me, I think that you should write this before he died. Oh. You should write your memoirs, and there should be a lot of sex in it, but you shouldn't publish it till after I'm dead, <laughs> because if I read it, then I would drop dead. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> he really said that to me. That's amazing. Bless him. <laughs> so, you know, with in regard to functional medicine, and this obviously has been um, a way of life for you for most of your life. What advice would you give to a conventional physician, traditional practitioner, who is now getting frustrated with, finally getting frustrated with the traditional manners of which she's been taught to practice medicine? That's a wonderful question. So many of us work so hard in our training that we become cognitively biased to what we've learned, and we think we've learned it all. But a mind is like a parachute. It works best when it's open. And you cannot avoid the facts that we have the first generation of kids who will not live as long as their parents. It's an independent risk factor to be a child today. We're seeing sleep apnea, type 2 diabetes in young children out of Mexico. There have been replicated studies now that have found in MRIs of kids in autopsy studies that there's early Parkinsonian and Alzheimer-like changes in the brain in 6- and 7- and 8-year-old kids. Things are changing. Milestones of reproduction are changing. You, and this was not taught in med school. And people are not getting well. People are sicker. So the reality of it is, is that the isness of today is a different world. We live in a toxic world, and we need different answers to get people well. Functional medicine looks not to use Band-Aids. We have a medical system that's broken because we focus on Band-Aids and procedures that make a lot of money. And of course, everyone wants to make money. There's no problem with that. But those Band-Aids and procedures aren't getting people well. They just keep them in a learned helplessness and stuck on a conveyor belt. If you really want to open that parachute, if you really want to get people well, if you look around and see we live in a toxic world where the ground rules of life have so changed that humanity has a flashing red light, our kids are the canary in the mines, you must practice differently to change the tide, to remediate the profession so that the answers will serve humanity and not let humanity keep going down this path. So at the conferences I had the honor to be part of at the Center for Bioenvironmental Research, the last few years, it was mostly populated by the deans of environmental health sciences of prestigious institutions around the world. The last few years, they'd get really drink a lot <laughs> the symposiums because they felt the earth had gone beyond a point of remediation. They were so saddened. So the last symposium, we got a lot of people to focus on remediation, to come in and give us some answers about how we might save the planet. And there were answers. And what was shocking was a lot of those answers sounded naturopathic. They started embracing nutrition and changing diet at these scientific academician type symposiums. So we need to remediate medicine. We need to save humanity that needs help. And the way that medicine has been practiced for chronic care, we certainly have great medicine for if you're, you're having an eye disease or you need to go to the ER, you need to have a hip surgery. We have marvelous parts of medicine. But still the population, many of us are getting more ill and our kids are getting ill. All over the world, mothers are saying, what's wrong with our kids? So if you are an allopathic physician, open that parachute. I think we'll end it right there. Thank you so much, Dr. Brookson. It's really been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. I think we should go on the road. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>